So, did you feel a difference of treatment between Ukrainians, refugees, and yourself? Sure. She said, "Oh, but I'm not a Ukrainian, so I should leave." You don't have plus the benefit of aux Ukrainians. Like, we're humans too. I met Joanna while I was walking towards the border crossing between Poland and Ukraine. She's 17 years old from Nigeria, and she's one of the many African students that found themselves trapped in Ukraine when the Russian invasion started. This is what she says happened to her as she was fleeing the war. So you arrived with this? Yeah, I'm an African. A Nigerian precisely studying in VN Karazin National University, Kharkov, Ukraine. I'm studying medicine and I'm a first year medical student. Yeah. At first I was I wasn't seeing the need to leave because um there was a time Putin Russia actually gave a date for the war. It got so serious there were bombings in Kharkov, my city. We had to hide in underground bunkers for our safety. We could hear bomb sounds. We weren't sure of the next second, the next minute, and then there was chaos everywhere, so I just had to leave. I've never gone through something like that, something close to that. I booked a taxi to take me to the Poland border. He collected a whole lot of money for me. He was supposed to drop me at Medica, but then he did not. He said, no, just walk down a bit and you'll see the Poland border. And then we started walking thinking, okay, we are close to Poland border. I mean, we had to walk the whole day not even the whole day throughout the night we were very cold we were hungry we couldn't sleep at all even if i wanted to it was just too cold to sleep i was shivering then you arrived at the the border patrol uh, between ukraine and poland and what happened to you there can you explain to me uh, when i got there i don't know i i i would say I didn't like the experience there they just kept us there for no reason for I don't know why and they were letting other Ukrainians go we've been we were there for like five hours more and then a Ukrainian just came like she didn't even need to ask or anything she just passed like once they see a Ukrainian coming they even hit us to leave the way like hit us and like leave 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 and let her pass and I mean, the fact that we are not in our country doesn't mean that we are not humans. I'm not saying they shouldn't let Ukrainians pass, but I'm like, let everybody pass. Like, we are all going to find a refuge, so let us go. Joanna says she eventually managed to cross the border with a group of Ukrainian women. After I spoke to her, I met with dozens of other African students who also made it to Poland and had a similar statement. When we heard about the attack, the bombs and everything, we knew that, okay, this is real and it is time to leave. Meanwhile, it was already too late because some of us had had flight that day. Flights were cancelled. While in the train, a lady just saw me and told me to get out of the train for no reason. The train we got into together. We walked for eight good hours to get to the border. So when we get to the border, they just pack blacks like they pack us at one place for more than three hours. We are just standing there. And I asked her, why do I have to leave the train? She said they only let children and women into the train and I, I asked her am I a man I'm also a woman she said oh but I'm not a Ukrainian so I should leave and I was like this train doesn't belong to you this is the government train and he wants people to get to the border with this train and she was like she's a Ukrainian and it's her government so she has the right to be on the train as she get down they left us outside people were crying begging them they don't even open the door for anybody they leave us outside under that cold for two days before they can open the border for us Arrivé au niveau de, de la frontière le, le, la police euh, euh, de l'Ukraine décidait que toutes euh, les choses, les Ukrainiens soient évacués avant que les, euh, les Africains soient aussi évacués. Donc euh, ça donnait plusieurs bagarres au niveau de la frontière parce qu'il y avait une accumulation d'Africains au niveau de euh, la frontière. Ukraine is home to tens of thousands of African students studying engineering or medicine. Amid the chaos, Polish authorities said that third country nationals would be allowed to enter the country. So you still have a lot of travel to do? Yeah, I do. Then how do you feel about the idea that it's not done yet? I mean, I feel sad.
even in war, being dark-skinned, as they call it here on earth, black, is a crime. The level of hate towards dark-skinned or black people, as it is referred to, is appalling all over the world. What is it that makes people who claim to be fair-skinned hate other humans who are dark-skinned so badly that even at war times, like it is happening in Ukraine right now, dark-skinned people are left behind to die, to suffer, to go through excruciating pain in order to survive in life. I mean, the war going on in Ukraine right now is traumatizing enough for everyone caught up in it. And to be dark-skinned or black, as it is referred, and be caught up in such a war, but be refused help when needed, help to escape, help to safety during wartime, but be denied for no reason but for the color of one's skin is even more traumatizing, morally wrong, and heartbreaking. I mean, look at this 17-year-old teenager having to experience such level of racism and hate. It's heartbreaking. Racism is a dividing factor amongst humanity that lingers on into, if not checked, destruction of one another. It's got to stop. And how would this be achieved but by putting out acts of love for one another? When you see such acts of hate or racism being displayed, stand up and speak against it. Speak out. Stop being complacent. Because if you don't speak out against such act, then it will continue. Just because you're not being, you think you're not being affected, doesn't mean the hate is not going to be practiced against you through other ways, unprovoked. We have seen cases where acts of hatred are being meted on Asians and Mexicans. Hence, any acts of hatred or racism towards another should be condemned. There's racism in the Ukraine. There are racist Ukrainians. So let me do it this way because I think people will blur the lines. I'm anti-war, but as my grandmother would say, I got plenty of walking around sense. What Putin is doing in Ukraine is wrong, it's morally wrong. What some Ukrainians are doing to black people inside of their country is wrong as well and racist as hell. Now, reporters who are reporting on this are also showing their extreme racism in how they contextualize European countries. And I'm going to break all of this down in real time. Let me take you to the first video. Now with the Russians marching in, it's changed uh, the calculus entirely. Uh, tens of thousands of people have tried to uh, flee the city. There will be many more. People are hiding out in bomb shelters. But this isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, uh, city where you wouldn't expect expect that or hope that it's going to happen. So it's partly human nature, but they are not in denial. Me, I'm sorry, it's very emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed, children being killed every day with Putin's missiles and his helicopters and his rockets. And so, of course, I, I understand and respect the emotion. What you are outlining there is this tension between longer term efforts to apply pressure to Vladimir Putin, such as financial sector sanctions and the very immediate military threat which you're experiencing. Just to put it bluntly, these are not refugees from Syria. These are refugees from uh, neighboring Ukraine. And that, quite frankly, is part of it. These are um, Christians, they're white, they're, um, they're very similar to people, I many people who live in the whole the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. This is Europe. These are good Christian white people. I mean, they're civilized, as the first reporter said. It's not like uh, Morocco. 
These aren't refugees from Syria. They should be ashamed of themselves. They are human beings. Bias, prejudice, systemic racism on display in international journalism and you just saw it. Remember one lady said, they're white Christians as if somehow their lives because they happen to be white or belong to a particular religious category, their lives are much more sophisticated and valuable than those who are not. Now, they may not see it that way because their bias could likely be implicit. I don't give a damn which one it is. The impact of it is the same. The impact of hyper aggressive bias and implicit bias is the same for the person on the other side of the bias. Those were just a few clips. Let me give you some more background, all right? Cities under siege across the Ukraine are home to tens and thousands of African students studying medicine, engineering, and military affairs. Morocco, Nigeria, and Egypt are among the top 10 countries with foreign students in Ukraine together supplying over 16,000 students, according to the education ministry. Thousands of Indian students are also trying to flee. What was meant to be a cheaper alternative to studying in Western Europe or the United States has turned overnight into a war zone as Russian tanks, planes and ships launched the biggest European invasion of another nation since World War II. With flights grounded, African governments thousands of miles away are struggling to support their students. The students, Reuters spoke to said they have had no help from home. I'm gonna give you more to this. Now, we have video, we have seen images of Ukrainians stopping black travelers from getting on trains, stopping their movement in favor of whites. We have seen this. We have also seen the Twitter feeds of individuals who are giving us updates as they come. This is racist. Now, here's what's going to happen. You see, Putin is well aware that the international community is against what he's doing, by and large, okay? Obviously, there's some exception. He's going to use this against Ukraine, and it will continue to be a public relations nightmare, it's a war inside of a war. The race dynamic or the racial injustice is the war that has already been there before this war started because racism is a global dynamic, not simply contextualized through the American experience. And if the leadership of Ukraine, if they don't step up and denounce what Ukrainians are doing, You will see other nations, especially those connected to Africa, they will start not supporting the Ukraine fight against Russia. That will happen. There's more. Um, Here are some stories shared across Twitter. Uh, Stephanie Haggerty said uh, a Nigerian medical student at Poland Ukraine border told me she has been waiting seven hours to cross. She says border guards are stopping black people and sending them them to the back of the queue saying they have to let Ukrainians through first. Dr. Alakija, black Africans are being treated with racism and contempt in Ukraine and Poland. We cannot ask African nations to stand in solidarity with them if they do not display basic respect for us, even in a time of war, ignored in a pandemic and left to die in a war, unacceptable. Now let's get back to some of the coverage, all right? The racist coverage that you just saw. CBS News senior foreign correspondent, Charlie D. Agata apologized Saturday saying for suggesting the war in Ukraine is particularly shocking because the country is relatively civilized and European compared to Iraq and Afghanistan. His characterization was among a flurry of similar commentary in the media that critics have slammed as racist 
and in some cases, historically inaccurate. So let me tell you one case where it's historically inaccurate. My first PhD, finished in 2016, talks about the warfare that has been waged across this globe in the name of religion. The number one colonizers and the number one catalyst for warfare are white people, white nations. That's not my opinion, that is a fact. And you can find all of my research and go to Google Scholars, Amazon is all published, all right? So, so that's one inaccuracy for sure, that somehow white nations are just too civilized for warfare. Uh, D. Agata responded to the criticism during a Saturday report saying, and I quote, I spoke in a way that I regret. And for that, I'm sorry. He said what he'd been trying to convey was that Ukraine had not seen war on this scale in recent years compared to conflicts he'd covered in other parts of the world. You can do that without using tropes, all right? Um, This is extreme, there are so many more examples. (sighs) Ms. Dahl, okay, when you heard this kind of reporting, when you saw it, I know this had to hit you too. What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my father's family is from the Middle East and hearing First of all, the reason why there's decades of war there is because we started that war. And there, her description, it's, it was heartbreaking that the Syrian refugees were turned away in Europe after what they were going through. And her description of them was just wrong. They were actually highly educated in Syria. And you know, so we mischaracterize the Middle East over and over and over. and. And in terms of global racism, I think you're absolutely right. I've always thought that actually. I think in some ways, it, we just talk about it more here. We have freedom of speech, we have democracy, and we're able to have these conversations. But perhaps we have less racism here mm-hmm. than in other places. And so I'm glad that you're bringing this up. And it's, it is during terms of war that the most vulnerable of any community gets impacted the most. So it's really, uh, such a bad situation that they're in and I'm really so sorry for that. We stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who are being discriminated against. We stand up for historically marginalized communities. We make absolutely no ambiguity about that. I also must echo the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he stood against the Vietnam War. And he said, when America is at war, it has a way of desensitizing those in the country because the policies that we're fighting for take a back burner during wartime. So I want everyone to be reminded we have a war right here in America that we're fighting on the social front every day. Don't lose focus of that as well.